Day, grade 12 learners of South Africa, welcome to Mindset. And to be with me for the next hour or so, we're going to be going through the eye and the ear. Now remember, the eye and the ear are sense organs and they're part of the nervous system. And they are wonderful sense organs. Um, we don't always appreciate what we see. When you get out of school today or when you finish whatever it is that you're doing, go outside, look at what is outside find a beautiful flower and just look at it and just savor it for a minute all right our eyes are amazing and and our, our mouths to taste and our ears to hear and then i mean without hearing just think of all the beautiful sounds that are out there and hearing someone's voice that you really care for is that not wonderful now that's what we'd be going to be focusing on today the eye and the ear and how they work and why it is possible for us to see and for us to hear. So we start off with, and have a look at my slide, very proud of this slide that I found it. It was on Wikipedia and we have the eye. So think about it. We've got the orbit of the eye. All right, so if you feel, you can feel you've got this bone there and the eye is sunken, it's inside. So if somebody whacks you square on the eye like this, it cannot harm the eyeball. Then we have the eyelid. And the eyelashes, now eyelashes are not just there to look beautiful and to put mascara on ladies, although it's unfortunate that most of the males in this world have the most divine eyelashes and us girls, well, we have to use mascara. But your eyelashes are there to protect anything from coming into your eye. So it's a protection mechanism. And then <clears throat> you've got the actual eyeball. So <clears throat> I put this slide in as well, which I thought was quite strange. It almost looks awesome seeing someone with two different colors. It's called heterochromia. Chromia mean color and hetero mean different. So this is someone that has two different eye colors. Very rarely will you find someone genetically with a brown eye and a blue eye. You may have a blue and a green, or in this case, you've got a greenish color and a hazel color. But that's quite awesome because what you've got there is incomplete dominance that's taken place. Okay, the eyes are clearly our organs of sight. The light waves are perceived as photo. Now remember the word photo means light. Receptors, they receive the stimulus located in the retina of the eye. Now those photoreceptors are made up of rod, and rod cells and they are to perceive light and dark and also for peripheral vision, believe it or not. And then cone cells are for color. And that's easy to remember because the C for cone and the C for color. So your photoreceptors in the retina of the eye, and we're going to go through the, through the eye now, and you'll see where the retina is. They are your rod cells, light and dark. So it's your rod cells that you'll be able to see in the dark with. All right, um, and that will help you to perceive light and dark, but color, you cannot see color without light. Now, I know you don't believe me, going to tonight, um, walk into your bedroom with all the lights off and the curtains drawn and see if you can see any color in your bedroom. You will not, everything will look shades of black and white, okay, and gray, because we need light to be able to see color. So your cone cells, in the retina, the photoreceptors are for color and the rod cells for black and white. All right, and yes, it is true, animals can only see black and white. They see in black and white. All right, impulses are passed along the optic nerve, all right, to the occipital lobe of the brain, that's at the back of the head of the cerebral cortex where the impulses are perceived and interpreted. All righty, so here is our eye. And if you look at our, the eye, Let's just get it right in the middle of the screen. This picture clearly comes from Encyclopedia Britannica, 1994. So that's an old one, but it was a nice one that I could find. So what we've got is you've got this first layer around the eye. And that first layer is called the sclera. And the sclera extends into a transparent cornea. 
And when people wear contact lenses, the contact lenses go over the top of the cornea. So the cornea is transparent, but the sclera is white. Now, guess what? Today, I have an eyeball. You see? There's my eyeball. And this white area here is the sclera. That's our outer layer. Now, the sclera then extends into the transparent here. If I take this off and I'll take this out. The transparent, I hope you can see this, the transparent cornea. It extends into it. All righty. Now, back to our diagram. We then have the next layer. And this next layer, as you'll see, is dark. It's the middle layer. And that middle layer extends into the iris of the eye. Now, if we go back, that is the iris of the eye. All right? So there's the sclera. It extends into the cornea, which is transparent. And underneath that is the iris. It's the colored part of the eye. All right? So there's the iris. And in the middle of the iris, this hole there, it's a hole. The hole is called the pupil. And the iris fits around that pupil almost like a curtain, like a drawstring. You know when you have a bag and it's got like a drawstring in the top and you can close it? I'm like a laundry bag. Now if I open it, then the hole comes bigger. And if I draw the string closed, the, the hole will close. <clears throat> that is how the iris works around the pupil. The pupil's not a structure, it's just a hole. Okay. Now, you can see here, the second, so that's our outer layer is the sclera. The second layer is the choroid layer. And the choroid layer is dark because it contains pigment and it contains the blood vessels to the eye. Now, that extends into the iris of the eye and the iris is what regulates the size of the pupil. Alrighty, now, we move to our next layer, which is the layer in yellow. And that layer is the retina. That's our third layer. And it's in the retina that we have our photoreceptors. In other words, our rod cells and the cone cells. The rod for black and white and perception of, of movement and the cone cells for color. All right, now in the middle here of the retina is that, that, that area there is the fovea centralis, or we can also call it the yellow spot. And what the yellow spot does is that is our focal point. So, people, if I look at this pen, all right, now if I look at the pen and I'm not looking at the camera, I look squint. All right, why? I'm focusing on this object. This image is now going to be put into the back, the image of this object, onto the back of my eye. That's my focal point. I can see over here, all right, and I can see over here, but I'm not focusing on it. It's almost like blurry. I'm looking at this thing here. So I'm focusing on something that will fall here on the yellow spot, which is the fovea centralis. Then we have the blind spot. Now coming off this yellow portion, you've got the blind spot and this is where the optic nerve exits the eye. Now think about it. You're not going to put a bed or a couch in a door, in the doorway. You'll never do that. Why? Because you're going to be able to move through that doorway. Well, the impulses from those photoreceptors, the rods and the cones, those impulses have to be carried via the optic nerve to the occipital lobe of the brain. So this is like a doorway. So you're not going to put something in that doorway. So guess what? That's what we have as the blind spot. In other words, there are no receptors, no rod and cone cells here at the blind spot because it's where the optic nerve exits the eye. And that is very often a question in the exam. Now, coming in closer, also here, part of this area here, which is part of the choroid, we also have a muscle, and that little muscle there is called the ciliary muscle. Ciliary muscle. And what that ciliary muscle does is it controls the suspensory ligaments, or the ciliary body ciliary muscle. It controls the suspensory ligaments. 
and the lens is attached to the, those suspensory ligaments. So suspensory, the lens suspends on it. So let's look at our eye here. We have the sclera, and the sclera has the muscle attachments. Those are our different ocular motor muscles to make the eye look up and down and sideways. Okay, our next layer is the choroid layer. All right, and the choroid is this dark, why? It's full of blood vessels, all right? And it's got a pigment in it to absorb excess light. Now it extends, the choroid extends into the iris. The iris curtains around the hole, which is the pupil. Now if I remove the choroid layer, I then have the lens. And the lens is attached and held in place by suspensory ligaments. They hold that lens in place. All right. Then I have this inner um, area. Now, if we go back to the to the um, smart board, here you've got fluid on this side of the lens, and you have fluid on this side of the lens. The fluid in this area of the lens is called the vitreous humor. And it gives the eyeball its shape. So if you were to take a needle and stick it into an eye, this fluid would come out and the eye would actually squish in on itself. Like a soccer ball that has no air in it. Okay? So this here is the vitreous humor. And this lighter liquid here is called the aqueous humor. Now this is more liquidy, it's more watery. Whereas this here is more gel type fluid. All right, people, I hope that you'll be able to see in here, that's the yellow spot. And that's going to be the fovea centralis, all right? And then if you look just over here, there's a, a sort of a whitish area. That is where the optic nerve exits the eye. So this inner layer here is going to be the retina. Now, if we go back to our diagram here, you'll notice that the retina doesn't go in around and cover the whole area of the eye. Your sclera goes all the way around because it extends into the transparent cornea and then back. Your choroid layer goes all the way through and stops at the iris to create the pupil or the hole. And then your retina comes in over here and the retina starts about there and it then extends into the back of the eye. With the yellow spot over there being your focal point and the blind spot being where the optic nerve will exit the eye. Actually, it should be that way around. So your focal point there and the yellow and the white or blind spot over there. Now it stands to reason you're going to have a blank blind spot and that is what, how the eye works. Now this lens attached to those suspensory ligaments, the lens is like, um, okay, this is solid, all right? But if you look here, this is what the lens looks like. And when the lens is at rest, it's going to be flat. And when it is contracted, it, it, when, the, when the ciliary muscles pull towards the lens, the lens is going to become rounded. But it's the lens that helps you to focus. Okay, people, we're looking at lenses and refraction. So the first thing I'm going to explain to you is a flat surface. A flat surface or a mirror, if I have an object over here, let's say this object is about one meter, now remember, I'm not doing the science version, I'm doing the life sciences version. <coughs> this is my object, and this is the image that's going to be created if I look on a flat surface. So, when I look into this mirror, I'm going to see myself or the candle about a meter away. All right, it's one meter away. That's what we're going to see, that's the image. Although the image will look like it's one meter inside the mirror. That we are going to see exactly the same as we have. That's a flat surface. Now, when we start to bend the surface, and for this I need for you to go and get a teaspoon when we're done here. And I want you to take that teaspoon and have a look whether what I've said to you actually works. Because that's the best way to know something or to learn something is to see it firsthand. If I take a surface that's bent like this, okay, it caves in. So this would be concave. 
It's concave because, look at it, it caves in over here. Now, if it caves in over here, we end up with this happening. So if my object is here, it's going to then be turned around to an upside down image when the lens or the surface caves in. When I look at a surface that caves outwards, we say that this is convex. <coughs> it doesn't cave, it bends outwards. And the minute it bends outward, what happens is the image comes in here and it does this. So if my candle is over here, which is my object, it's going to be a smaller object after the light has been bent. Now this bending of the light is called refraction. Here, when the image and the object are similar, we say it is a reflection. You see your reflection when you're walking in the shops and you can see yourself in the shop mirrors and the shop windows. But when the light is bent, so to bend light, we say that the light is refracted. So we talk about refraction of light. When the surface is rounded, you will see an upside down image. When the surface is curved this way, you'll see a very tiny distorted image. Now take a teaspoon or a spoon, a serving spoon is actually very nice. Take your spoon and look at the inside of the spoon and you'll be upside down. You turn it around and you, you definitely don't look that way. Okay, but if you turn it around, you'll be tiny and small, you looking in your reflection, looking into it or your refracted light looking into it and you'll be distorted. So that is what refraction does. Refraction is the bending of light. Now, if we go back to um, the eye here, you've got the cornea, which is going to be convex to the light coming in. You've got the lens on this side is going to be convex to the light coming in. And you've got the inside of the lens, which is going to be concave to the light coming. Because remember, your light's coming in here like that. So that's convex, that's convex, and that's concave. And it's because this side of the lens is concave that the image is upside down and is put upside down on the back of the eye. All right, so let's look at how our eye works. Path of light. The light rays pass from the object of the eye through the transparent cornea, the aqueous humor, the biconvex lens, and you know what? I'm going to go back to the eye here, and I'm going to show you this way. Because I've got the path of light in your X notes, in your X sheets, and you can follow with me. Okay? This is the best way to do it. So, we start off here and we say, right, the light comes in through the transparent cornea, okay, which is convex in shape, passes through the aqueous humor, through the pupil, and through the convex side of the lens. The light passes through the lens and out through the concave side of the lens, through the vitreous humor, Remember, this is the vitreous humor, which is like a gel substance, until it strikes the retina. And when it reaches the retina, the photoreceptors, the rod and cone cells, will convert the light stimulus into an impulse, and the impulse will move out through the optic nerve. Now, people, look here. What you see with your right eye is perceived in the left occipital lobe of the brain and what you see in the left eye is perceived in the right side of the occipital lobe. Why? Because as the optic nerves come out of the eye, they cross over and go into the occipital lobe of the brain, which is where you perceive your vision. All right, so that is the path of light. So. Convex cornea, the aqueous humor, the, the lens, biconvex, because the lens is this shape, 
it's biconvex, okay, and the vitreous humor. Then the light passes through the curved shapes of the cornea and the lens. Light is refracted. Remember, refraction means the lens refracts the light rays and forms an inverted, which means upside down image on the retina, okay? And then the rod and cone cells, which are our photoreceptors, will convert the stimulus of light into an impulse, which is the language of the brain. Okay, it's the language of the brain and the impulses are transmitted along the optic nerve, along through the optic chiasma, which is where it crosses over, into the lower visual centers opposite the midbrain in the occipital lobes. And that brings the image up, up the uh, right side up so that we can then interpret the size and the shape and the color of the object that we've seen. Now, how does the eye do this? It has to accommodate. And what is accommodate? Now, when people are accommodating, it means that they help you do whatever it is that you, or do whatever it is you want them to do. They're accommodating, all right? Now, accommodation in the eye is the bending of the lens to make it round or to make it flat. Now, remember, if a surface is round or rounded like this, it's going to bend light. If it is very rounded, it's going to bend the light a lot. If it is flatter, it's going to bend the light less. So the more bent the surface is, or shaped the surface is, or curved, the more it will refract the light. The flatter it is, the less refraction. The more curved it is, the greater the refraction. And if it bends this way, okay, that way, then it is concave. If it bends that way, it is convex. So we've got accommodation. Please note two C's, two M's. All right, now we have binocular vision, which means we see with two eyes, bi, two. Ocular, to see. Humans focus on one object with both eyes. So therefore, we actually have an increased field of vision. Now, a sharp image falls on each of the retinas because you've got two eyes. So the image from the left eye is not always the same as the right. Now, what I want you to do as well, you've got to remember all these things when we finish. Take a pen or your finger even, all right, and look at the finger. Now, close your left eye and look at your finger. Close your right eye and look at your finger. Left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye, and it'll feel like your finger's moving left and right because we do not see identically with both our eyes. Look at our eyes, they're not on top of each other, they are apart. So each eye will have its own image. Now remember your brain has to take those two images and mush them together like a good editor. All right, so the image from the left eye is gonna be slightly different from the right eye. <clears throat> now the two images join in the brain at the occipital lobe and it results in what we call stereoscopic vision. Now. Come on, you new age kids. You all know about stereo. What is it when you listen to something in stereo? It means you have an earplug in both ears and you're listening to your iPod or whatever it is that your, or your cell phone and the music there. Because you're listening with both ears. So it's stereo, it's going in. Now stereo here means the same thing. You've got two eyes. So it's stereoscopic and it's that scene with two eyes and two different images that get put together in your brain that helps you to judge distance to judge depth. Um, if so, a car is driving towards you, you are able to judge how far the car is and the speed. So you are able to judge distance and depth. And that's the biggest thing and the most important thing. So it helps us to judge distance to depth and also the size of an object. If I see something far, 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 far away, I, <clears throat> let's say um, I'm standing on a hill and I'm looking down and I can see a farmer or somebody walking along or pushing a bike far, far, far away, say half a kilometer or two kilometers away, okay? They look this big, but I know it's a full-size grown-up person. I know it's not a little thing like an ant walking along. I know what the size is. Why? The brain has learned to interpret it. The eyes can change the convex curve of the lens and therefore the focal point. Because remember, the more bent it is, 
the more it will refract light. So this, I'll have lots of refraction. Here, I'll have less refraction. And this process is called accommodation. People, you must know your diagrams. This here is just a picture to show you how we perceive. There's the, the left and the right eyes. And our optic nerve crosses over. So there's the optic chiasma. And it goes into the occipital lobe of the brain. And we then are able to interpret the color and the shape and the size and the distance of this little ladybird flying towards our eyes. OK, now, near vision. We are going to have a round lens. Okay, because it is for objects that are close to us. So if it's close, it's going to be round. And it's for near vision, to see things close by. So when viewing an object that's anything less than six meters, the ciliary muscles contract, causing the ciliary body to move closer to the lens. Because remember, the ciliary muscles sit here. And when they contract, they move towards the lens. So if the lens is here, they then move towards the lens, they pull towards the lens, they contract towards the lens, which means the lens, which is like jelly on the inside, becomes nice and round. And the rounder it is, the more it will bend light. That's why it's so important for you to understand this. So when the ciliary muscles contract, the ciliary will, body will move closer to the lens. All right? So the suspensory ligaments that hold the lens in place are going to become slack. And when they slack, the lens can then go round, so it becomes more convex and more rounded. And therefore, it is able to refract more. So the focal length decreases, and it brings the object onto the yellow spot in the retina. These are the diagrams. So rather than learning a whole bunch of words, look at your diagrams, OK? We've got, this is set for near vision, so the object is close to us. It's closer, so it's from six meters and closer. All right? This is the side view. That's the eye we saw earlier. And this is what it will look like from the front. And the reason I'm showing you this is so you don't confuse this with the way the pupil works. This is not the pupil. We're talking about the lens. So we've got the, ciliary, uh, uh, um, the circular ciliary muscles sit here. They go all the way around. So you can see they're all the way around. Then you have your suspensory ligaments. They're all nice and slack. You see, they wiggle woggle like that. Okay, they're all the way around. And here in the middle is the lens. And the lens will become more convex. So it's going to look nice and round like this from the side, as you can see it here. It's a nice round little lens. So the light is going to be, as the light comes in here, it's going to be very, very bent so that it can then focus on the yellow spot exactly. All right. Distant vision is a long lens, because think of long distance. OK, it's far away. Now, when viewing an object that is more than six meters, OK, at rest, the eyes are set for distant vision. And you know what? That's how your teachers know when you are daydreaming and your mom or your dad know that you're not paying attention when they're talking to you. Because a person gets that far away look because the eyes are set for distant vision when you are relaxed and you are not focusing. So that's how we know when our learners aren't paying attention. So set for more than distant vision, that's when your eyes are at rest. They look far, far, far away, out into the never-never. So the ciliary muscles will relax. And remember, when, if they contract and they pull towards the lens and the lens becomes rounder, the opposite is going to happen now. So the ciliary muscles will relax. And as they relax, they pull back and the suspensory ligaments will pull tight. We say that they become taut. They become tight. And as they pull back like that, it stretches that lens to make it longer and thinner. So it is now less convex. So it's gone from being nice and round for near vision. And it will pull long like that. Now look at this. Your sides are now less convex. They're less bent. So therefore, 
refraction will be decreased. The light will be less bent and the focal length increases, bringing the object onto the yellow spot of the retina. So if we look at our diagram, this is for distant vision. Look at the lens. We have a long lens. You see that? And therefore, less refraction. Okay? So the ciliary muscles sit there and they relax. When they relax, they pull backwards. They pull away. So the suspensory ligaments become taut. They get pulled tight. Chips. And as they pull back, it pulls that lens longer. So the lens becomes flattened and longer. And if it is longer, there is less refraction, people. All right, pupillatory mechanism. Pupillatory comes from the word pupil. And a pupil is worked on reflex. You cannot control the size of your iris or the size of your pupil. You cannot. It is done automatically and controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Okay? It is automatic. If you take, um, uh, if, if somebody takes a, a torch and they just flick that torch across your vision and back again, your pupil is going to constrict and then as soon as the light moves away, it's going to open up. If you um, get, get a brother or a sister or your mom or your dad or your granny or somebody at home and tell them to sit looking, take them outside. And while they're sitting there on a chair comfortably, relaxing, tell them to look far away. And then take your hand and you put your hand over their eyes. Tell them to close their eyes and you just put your hand so you cover all light. Ask them to open their eyes and then move your hand away and you'll actually be able to see how the pupil constricts. It's actually awesome to, to see. Be careful of shining a torch directly into someone's eye because you can damage the retina, all right? And never look up into, directly into the sunlight, ever, 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 because you will hurt and damage your photoreceptors. All right, so pupillatory mechanism, remember it's a reflex action and it's autonomic nervous system controls it. So what are we doing? We're controlling the amount of light that goes into the photoreceptors, to those rod and cone cells. Why? Because if we don't, we will damage those photoreceptors. So the iris works like a curtain and it controls the amount of light entering the eye. How? It changes the size of the pupil. Now remember, the pupil is just a hole. Your iris fits around the, the, the pupil like a, um, a laundry bag with a drawstring. As you pull the string, it will close, and as you release it, it will open. And that is how the iris works. So, we have circular muscles and radial muscle fibers that regulate the size of the pupil. How? Pupillatory functioning. Now, this is why I said you be careful that you don't confuse accommodation with this. Okay, so we've got the choroid layer. Remember, the choroid extends into the iris. If you look here, the choroid extends into the iris with the hole, you see, the hole in the middle, which is the pupil. What I've done is I've given you a diagram with bright light and dim light. Bright light meaning bright sunlight, torchlight, whatever. Here, dim light, it's getting darker. So what we have is the choroid layer, which extends into, this is the iris. This whole part here, is the iris okay let me put your iris so you don't forget what it is that you're looking at all right now we've got circular muscles and we have radial muscles they're like the spokes of a wheel now function mainly on the circular muscles because the radial will always work opposite they work antagonistically these two they work opposite to each other. So if the circular muscles contract, the radial muscles will relax and vice versa. So we say, right, when it's very bright, we don't want a lot of light to pass through this iris. So we must, um, through the pupil, so we must make it small. So how do we do that? When the circular muscles contract, so that circular muscles contract, the pupil will constrict. Remember, constrict means to get small. So the pupil constricts. So there are your three C's. So when it's bright, 
the circular muscles will contract and the pupil will constrict. And the radial muscles work opposite, so therefore the radial muscles will relax. And that will make the pupil small. When it is dim light, in other words, there isn't a lot of light and your eyes need to see and they need to get as much light in as possible because you can't see without light. It is exactly the opposite to bright light. Circular muscles will relax. The pupil will dilate because that's the opposite to contract and it will get larger. So the radial muscles will contract. So as the radial muscles contract, it pulls the circular muscles to relax and the pupil is then pulled open. So quite literally, if you learn pupillatory functioning in bright light, your dim light is exactly the opposite. You only have to learn one thing. Visual defects. People, you've got to know visual defects. You've got to know what defects can cause an eye not to see. So, short-sightedness is also called myopia or nearsightedness. Now, what happens here is if you are nearsighted, it means your lens is nice and round. And that's the problem. It is too convex. So, it bends the light too much. So, it's the refractive defect in the eye in front of the retina and the cornea is too rounded. So what do we have to do? The cornea, the lens, everything is too rounded. So the distant objects are going to look blurred. It's genetic, please remember that. Okay, and it also can result from old age. Okay, to become short-sighted. You, you, you actually can't see properly from sitting, straining your eyes for hours and hours. And that is why your teachers, when you're sitting there writing like this on the table, your teachers should say, Oi, never ever go closer than if you put your... This is ideal for your body, remember? If you take your elbow and you put your elbow down where you want to read and put your chin on your, on your fist, that is the right distance for your face to be from any paper. If you have to bring your face closer, you're putting strain on your eyes, people, because your eyes work the m closer an object is. When an object is far away, your eyes are relaxed, they're chilled. But when you bring it closer, your eyes have to work hard. <clears throat> so remember, myopia, short-sightedness, is genetic. And how do we do? We fix it with glasses. So glasses and contact lenses, why? They concave, you see, and they prescribe to reduce refraction. So the refractive surgery is also another option where they actually shave off the front of the cornea. So as the cornea sits like this, they shave the front of it off like that. And that then, you have less refraction so you can actually see. So here's a diagram. The diagram below represents a section through a part of a human eye. Now the minute you see this, you must know. You're looking at a lens, they're going to ask you something about accommodation. First thing we're going to do is label. So... If we look here, that eight, that membrane across the top is the conjunctiva. And if we get conjunctivitis, all right, what is conjunctivitis? It's when this membrane that's across the front of the eye, that membrane becomes inflamed. And it is very sore and very contagious. They will normally send you home from school. All right, so... You've got the conjunctiva. This first layer is the outer layer. That's the sclera. The second, this here comes in. This is the choroid, which lengthens into the iris. Then we have the pupil and the lens. And it is a biconvex lens. Bi means two, convex. Suspensory ligaments. All right, ciliary muscle or ciliary body. Let's put body, muscle, same thing. And then here, the t this is the vitreous humor. People, please learn your diagrams. Very, very, very important. You must know your diagrams. Okay, study the labels, numbered one, three, and or supply the labels, sorry, one, three, and five. We've done that. Supply the number. And the name of the part that controls the amount of light that enters the eye. I can't remember what number it is, but it's number two, which is the iris. Okay, so it's always controls the amount of light is the iris.
And in this case, it was number two. So you will do that. And that's where you get your two marks. So don't forget to put the number in. Okay, mention the changes that the part, it should be named, in question 1.2 will undergo when exposed to bright light. Okay, now remember the C's, bright light. So the um, ciliary, okay, let's just rather do this. I'm going to go back to our diagram. Okay, here your circular muscle is going to contract, the pupil is going to constrict, and the radial muscles are going to relax. So, remember the C's, the circular muscles contract, the pupil constricts, and the radial muscles, no man, radial muscles relax your three C's. And that will give you your four marks. Okay, then list one function for each of the parts four and seven, lens and vitreous humor. So what's the function of the lens? The main function of lens is going to be accommodation to focus the light onto the retina here at the back. That's what the lens's job is. It's to focus the light onto the retina of the eye and the vitreous humor, well, it's to give the eye its shape, to maintain the shape of the eyeball, but also it's part of the refraction medium and it helps the light to pass through to the back here, which is the retina. Um, supply the number and the names of the parts that are responsible for accommodation of the eye. Um, <clears throat> it's going to be um, the ciliary muscles, okay, and the lens. So it's the numbers responsible, so we're going to have to go back to our diagram. It's going to be the lens is number four and the ciliary body number six. See, what the reason they ask the question like that is to see if you know not just what the structure does, but what it looks like and where it is. All right? Explain the changes that will take place when part numbered in question 1.5 views an object closer than six meters. So what they want you to do here is look at accommodation And it's closer than six meters, so therefore it's going to be for near vision. All right, so I'm not going to sit here and redraw or re-explain. We're going to just look at our diagram for near vision. Here we go. The, ciliary, the circular ciliary muscles are going to contract. The suspensory ligaments are going to become slack. The lens is going to become more convex so that light is so that light is refracted more. And that's where your marks come from. So let's go through it again. To accommodate for near vision, the circular ciliary muscles will contract. The suspensory ligaments will become slack as the, as the circular muscles contract towards the eye, which means the lens will become rounder and more convex, and light is then refracted more to put the image onto the retina of the eye. Now, we need to look at long-sightedness, means to see far, and that's called hypermetropia, or far-sightedness. Now this is a refractive defect where the image focuses behind the lens. So remember short-sightedness, the image fell before the lens. So we now have to make things different. We've got to uncurve everything so that it can get to the back of the retina. When you are far-sighted or long-sightedness, the image falls behind. So it falls here, behind the eyeball. Okay, so here. So instead of falling here, it's falling here. 
So what must we do? We have to make the lenses rounder, okay? Things must be more convex, so the person will not be able to see objects that are close. Because why? The images are going to be blurred. This condition is caused by, by the following. The eyeball, that is too short, that's genetic. And we can correct that with prescription glasses or, or, or contact lenses. But remember, we have to make it more convex. So you're going to use lenses that are nice and round. Then when the lens cannot become round enough, now this is pure good old age. That's it. It's as we get old. And you'll notice, um, if, if you look at your, your aunts and your uncles and your, even your mom and your dad maybe, uh, but definitely your granny and your grandpas, they end up, their arm doesn't, isn't long enough anymore if they don't have their glasses with them. So they can't see here. They can see street signs that are a kilometre away, but they can't see anything over here. And that is pure good old age. Finish claw overs cordovas. We get old. The, the muscles, those ciliary muscles, just can't contract enough to make the lens round enough. Okay, so we stay at long distance vision. So what do we need? We need to make convex lenses and that's why we end up with that shape and then the cornea is too flat and if it's too flat well you, you need refractive surgery to fix it okay what I've got here are diagrams to show you again in comparison people if possible when you are learning or when you are looking at anything always learn comparisons because if you learn in a comparative table you'll be able to close your eyes and say right um, hot day, cold day, um, far-sightedness, near-sightedness. Whenever there's something like that, or pupillatory function, too much light, too little light, close your eyes and imagine a table and work in a comparison. And I promise you it's easier to learn because you're comparing something. It's not just pulling something out of the blue. So distant vision, long-sightedness, the eyeball shape is too rounded. So what do we want to do? The image is now falling behind the retina. We want it on the retina here. So we use a convex lens. And if, it is, if the lens for near, of near vision, <coughs> the eyeball shape is longer than normal, it's going to fall short here. So you're not going to be able to see it. It falls short because that's where the fovea centralis is. That's where the image has to fall. So we have to fix it. So we use biconcave, which means two concave lenses together. And what that does is it then pulls the image onto the back of the retina. Okay, astigmatism. Well, that's when we have irregular curvatures of the cornea. And in other words, it changes our focal points. It's like looking at a mirror. You know how irritating it is, you know, when they, in, in some shop stores. Us girls will know this. In shop stores where you've got these big mirrors and you stand there and you think, oh my gosh, I don't look like that. And you've got like a dimple over here or the shape of your head is a little bit funny. And it doesn't make you look good in the clothes that you're trying on. That's the same here. You've got a little ding in the mirror surface. Here you've got a ding in the curvature of the cornea. So what it does is it changes the vision. And you use glasses or hard contact lenses to fix that. Most people have astigmatisms, by the way. Then a cataract is the clouding of the lens. The only way to do that is to actually remove and scrape the inside. Now, it can be caused by lots of things. Too much ultraviolet light, radiation, diabetes, hypertension, old age, physical trauma, a good whack to the eye. So we end up with this cataract. And if you look at somebody, it looks like their pupil is white because you're seeing through the pupil into the back of the lens. They must be removed surgically. And we get extra capsular surgery that's used to remove the lens, leaving the lens capsule intact. You get intracapsular ex uh, uh, surgery. That's when both the lens and the capsule are removed and the lens is replaced with a plastic lens because otherwise you will not be able to see. All right, people, we now move on to the ear. Now, listen carefully. And do you, do you note the words I've just used? Listen carefully. In other words, we hear everything. And when we finished with this session, switch the television off, switch everything off, sit quietly, take a deep breath, and listen to what you can hear around you. And you will be able to listen to bird noises and 
people talking far away and maybe you can hear a bit of music somewhere, um, children playing, you will be able to hear. Hearing and listening are two completely different things. You don't have parents say to their children, hear me. You say, oi, listen to me. Your teachers as well will say, guys and girls, listen to what I have to say. Look at this. Now, looking and seeing, we see everything. But if we're not looking, we don't comprehend. Hearing, we hear everything. But we don't, we can only comprehend if we listen. So, here we have the ear. And the human ear, by the way, is like a fingerprint. This pinner, this thing here, is the pinner. And what the pinner does is it directs the sound in through into that little hole there, which is the auditory canal. So, a pinner is as individual to a human being as fingerprints and the iris of the eye. So, they are completely, you may look like you've got your dad's ears or your mom's ears, I promise you now they will be subtly different because there are no two people on this earth that have the same ears and even your left and your right ears are not identical. The same with your iris, the same with the fingerprints. All right, they are yours, uniquely yours. All right, so we have the pinner and the pinner's job is to guide the sound into the structure there called the auditory canal. The ears are our sense organs of hearing and look at this, we have the mechanoreceptors Mechano, mechanical, think of waves. So the sound waves are picked up by mechanoreceptors in the ear. They sit in the cochlea of the ear. But we're going to go through all the parts of the ear now. The impulses are, tra are transmitted by the sensory neurons to the auditory center, which sits in the cerebral cortex of the brain. Okay, the ears also are organs of balance and equilibrium. Why and how? Through the proprioreceptors. These impulses are transmitted to the cerebellum. So hearing goes to the cerebral cortex, to the auditory center, auditory to hear, and balance and equilibrium goes to the cerebellum so that we don't fall over. Remember, balance is this, is so that you don't fall on your nose or fall over backwards, and equilibrium is so that you can maintain a straight, upright posture. So balance and equilibrium. And if you remember it that way, you won't forget to put the two words together. All right, here we have the ear. Now bef before we go on to this ear, look what I've got here. I have an ear, a huge mammoth ear. All right, so here we've got the pinner. And the pinner directs the sound so that it travels down here. In fact, let me use a pen. It travels down here. All right. To, this is the auditory canal. Auditory to here. Auditory canal. Now, look at this. What do you see here? This is bone. And this is bone. And this is all bone. This is all part. This, this total area from here to here is the part of your skull. So the ear structure sits as a cavity inside your actual bone of your cranium. All right, so the sound will travel down the auditory canal and it gets to a little structure here, over here, sits right around here. And that little structure, if I can put my finger there, that little structure where my finger is now is the eardrum. And what does a drum do? If I bash on a drum, it vibrates, okay? So that vibration is passed from the eardrum, now we go back to our model, from the eardrum, and the eardrum vibrates. And the eardrum vibrates against the three tiniest little bones in our body. And if we look at our diagram over here, we've now got the sound coming in here through the pinna. It's directed down the auditory canal. It gets to the eardrum, or it's also called the tympanic membrane. But eardrum is good enough, and the eardrum vibrates. And the eardrum, touching it, are the three little bones. And those little bones are the tiniest little bones in the body. And they're called ossicles because they oscillate, they vibrate. And those ossicles 
amplify sound. And I'm telling you, if, I, if, if it was me setting your exam paper, I would ask you the function of the articles. First of all, what they are, to name them, and what their function is. It's to amplify sound. And that's why, if you look here, the ossicles sit in air. So we have air here, and we have air in here, so that those little bones can vibrate properly. And we have the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. The Latin names are malleus, incus, and stapes, but you don't need to know the Latin names. You only need to know the common names. So hammer, that's the same thing that you have when you hammer some a nail. Okay, a hammer, an anvil is the thing you hammer against, and the stirrup, it's like a horseshoe. You see that? So it's a stirrup, and the stirrup sits right flush up against the oval window. And below it, we have the round window. So remember, O comes before R, there is the round window. All right, now, this structure here, okay, look here. That's it, all right? So I'm going to move this ear away so you can see this against my top. All right, so we have this structure. is called the membranous labyrinth. A labyrinth is a, um, it, it's like a maze. So it's called the membranous labyrinth. And it sits here in a cavity in this bone, okay? It will fit in there like that. So we now take this membranous labyrinth out. All right. And then we say it looks like that. So you see these things here, these round things? Those are called your semicircular canals. They're only half circles. And these semicircular canals are at right angles to each other. That's for balance and equilibrium. <coughs> then we have this little bag-like structure and then another little piece. And that's the, I'm going to turn it this way. That's the utriculus and the little sacculus just before it goes into this round structure which looks like a snail. But the snail's been cut in half here. This round structure that looks like a snail. That's the cochlea. So semicircular canals, the utriculus, the sacculus and the cochlea. Lea. And the cochlea is for hearing, but the semicircular canals, the utriculus and the sacculus are for balance and equilibrium. All right, back to our diagram. We have the membranous labyrinth made up of the semicircular canals, the utriculus and the sacculus. You don't need, that's what you need to, utriculus, the sacculus and the semicircular canals. They are for balance and equilibrium. And this little thing that looks like a snail, that's called the cochlea. And the cochlea is our, organ, our sense organ. Our mechanoreceptors sit in here. Something very important, and I'm going to use colors now. In here, we have fluid. And that fluid in here is called endolymph. And it's that endolymph that transfers the sound waves in around here and the balance and the equilibrium. Everything is controlled by the endolymph. So the endolymph. And then we have perilymph. And the perilymph is all the way around here. Boy, I've got this fat cokey and I'm battling to draw in the lines. And that sort of falls in, the perilymph falls in between the bone, all right, the bone and the actual structures, which is where we're going to find the endolymph. Okay, very important, you must know the differences between that. Now, this area here, this middle ear, so this is the outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The inner ear is filled with air, so that your three bones can vibrate. Remember that the stirrup touches the oval window. So the path of sound is going to travel in. Let's do it in pink. It's going to travel in here. It's directed and channeled by the pinna down the auditory canal. Okay, makes the, vibra the, the eardrum vibrate. 
That vibration is passed to the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. They are three ossicles that amplify sound. The sound then passes through the oval window in through the perilymph, into the endolymph, and into the cochlea. And in the cochlea, we have things called the organs of corti. And the organs of corti are the receptors or the mechanoreceptors that are going to convert the stimulus of sound into an impulse. And that will travel then along the auditory canal. Any excess sound will come along and pass out here through the round window. That's the round window's function for excess sound to pass out. So that's why we don't hear an echo. It means we have no echo. We don't hear an echo. It passes out and almost into our throats. All right. Um, then we've got this tube. Now this tube, let's make it orange. This tube here is called the Eustacean tube. And you must know how to spell this. Please focus on your spelling here. The Eustacean tube. And what the Eustacean tube does is it opens up into your throat and it makes sure that the pressure inside the middle ear is the same as the pressure on the outside. Now, when you drive to the coast, okay, or you go up in an aeroplane, you feel the pressure and what you do is you, you, you open your jaws as high as you can and it relieves the pressure because you're opening the eustachian tubes. Now, in babies and toddlers, this eustachian tube is not very long. And when babies get effect infections or toddlers get infections in their throats, those bugs go up into the eustachian tube and into the middle ear and they end up with middle ear infections. That's why young babies and toddlers get middle ear infections more than adults do. Okay, people, so you've got all these things that can happen in hearing. So we're going to look at a couple of hearing defects and then we're going to go back to a question, all right? So we have middle ear infections are called otis media. And what that is, it's inflammation of the middle ear. Now, if you've ever had earache, you know how very, very painful it is. Because this, and if we look back at our little model, okay, this area here, as it's filled with little hairs and we produce wax to get anything out that doesn't belong there and it's got a bit of an anti uh, uh, antiseptic quality to it. But this area here is very sensitive. That's why we can't just stick things in our ear. And the eardrum, when it bursts, is incredibly painful. So you must remember that any pressure on that eardrum, whether it's from the middle ear or from the outer ear, is extreme pain. All right. And what happens is that the eustachian tube generally becomes blocked um, because it, and, and then it can't equalize the sound, uh, equalize the, the air pressure. Why? Because of mucus. So if you've got this mucus buildup, the poor eustachian tube blocks up. And in some cases, the eardrum will burst. And we want that pus to drain out. So we take antibiotics, and what that does is it ends up scarring the eardrum. Now, We've, I've explained to you why babies and, and uh, get more ear infections. So what they do for the babies is in the eardrum, all right? So you've got the, the pinna, you've got the auditory canal, and at the eardrum, they actually place these little structures in. And the, the most commonly used one is this one here. Now you can see how tiny it is. And what that does is it fits in. So if, if this is the eardrum, I'm sure you can see this. So if that's the eardrum, and there's the center of the eardrum, they take this little grommet and they put it so that one side is over here and it fits through to the other side there like that. Now it's got a little hole through the middle of it. So this is this one turned that way on its side. You can see it's got a hole. So in the middle ear here, what it will do is it will drain out, sorry, it will drain the fluid through the eardrum. Which means that when little kids have got that, they must not swim um, unless they put plugs in their ears because otherwise that water is going to go straight into the middle ear and we don't want that. It will hurt them. All right. So deafness. We're looking at impa uh, um, hearing impaired, hard of hearing, deafness. There are all kinds of wonderfully correct terms to use. But at the end of the day, deafness is a biological term, which means 
the hearing is not as it should be. So we get um, sensor, uh, sensorineal uh, hearing loss. Um, that would be neural. It's in the brain. Noise-induced hearing loss. That's when people work with very loud machinery every day, day in and day out. And when they get older, they're going to lose their sense of hearing. They won't be able to hear certain pictures. Genetic hearing loss is when people are born that way. Um, diseases that could cause hearing loss. People, very important. This is why when children get the, all these childhood diseases like measles and mumps, everyone is completely relieved. As you get older, there is more damage that can be done from those childhood illnesses. Measles can render someone completely deaf. Uh, meningitis, that's the meninges of the brain. Okay, people, let's have a look at our model again. All right, here's our little ear. This is bone. This is the bone of your, of your cranium. All right, here is where your brain is. So you've got your dura mater, your arachnoid, your pia mater, and the brain tissue. Now, when the meninges, which is the dura mater, arachnoid, or pia mater, the membranes around the brain are infected, there's not a lot of space here to get to the inner ear. And that infection renders the cochlea, if, if we look at our cochlea, here, here's our cochlea, all right? It sits here. It sits in this cavity here. So if there's an infection of the meninges, what happens? That infection can pick up here onto the cochlea so easy, it's not even funny because this is spongy bone as well here. All right, so it renders the cochlea so that it can't work properly anymore. You understand? It can't work. So the mechanoreceptors stop working and that ends up with deafness. So meninge meningitis, autoimmune diseases, mumps, fetal alcohol syndrome. This is when mommies drink too much when they are pregnant with their babies, okay? And they are alcoholics and they abuse alcohol and those poor little babies can be born deaf. Syphilis, an STD, which by the way can be healed with one good shot of penicillin and people don't even know they've got syphilis and it can end up with deafness. Physical trauma, you get a huge whack onto the head. I promise you now it will affect your hearing. Okay, people, now we look at hearing aids. What is a hearing aid? It's something that's going to assist someone who is, whose ears are not working as they should. And we also have cochlear implants. Now remember, your cochlea, if you look here, there's the cochlea. We have a cochlear implant, which is going to sit so that the cochlea can be stimulated. Now a hearing aid is an apparatus that's worn behind a person's ear. And here, I've got a little picture for you. This is a modern hearing aid. The old-fashioned ear hearing aid used to sit behind the ear and then go into the ear over here with a receiver sort of at the back of the ear and hidden. Today, we have far more modern ways of doing things. I mean, technology is amazing. And here you've got this little tiny thing here that will just go into the ear over here. So if we look back at our model, it's just going to sit here and no one can see it. And what it does is it amplifies the sound going down until it gets to the eardrum and the little um, ossicles because clearly they're not working properly anymore. All right. Then this here is what your cochlear implant will look like. So it fits again around the ear. All right. And this part of it actually goes into the bone and sits right in here in the bone near the cochlea. All right, and that is what a cochlear implant is. So you've got part of it that is on the outside and you've got part of it that sits on the inside in the bone. All right, so that amplifies at the end of the day, whether it's the hearing aid or the cochlear implant, it's going to amplify the sound so that the person is able to hear properly or better. Um, hearing, hearing aids are generally used when people, when, when, when everything deteriorates, but your cochlear implant is a surgical implant and it's an electronic device that stimulates the auditory um, nerves. All right? And it's, your cochlear implant is very expensive. Um, and it also requires quite a lot of therapy, people. People have to learn if they haven't been able to hear properly they have to learn to adapt to the noise. I remember my dad when I was a child, um, 
who, who had a hearing aid and 90% of the time he had it in because it made us all happier, but he'd switch it off. So he would hear even less than he would have without because it would sit there in his ear because he said that the noise irritated him. He didn't want to hear everything. He just wanted to be in his own little world. So that was something he chose. All right, now hearing defects and speech disorders. People, we learn as babies and toddlers, we learn to talk by mimicking. We mimic sound. Now, if you've ever tried to learn another language or you have somebody who's talking to you, you listen to the way they pronounce a word and then you try to imitate that word. We learn by mimicking sound. Now, imagine a little child that cannot hear. So what they can do is when you talk, do yourselves a favor, take your fingers and put it here at your throat. And as you touch your throat, make a noise, hum, and you'll be able to feel the vibrations. Now that is how people who cannot hear are taught to talk, is by vibrations. And it's very hard to try and mimic those vibrations. So we learn to talk and we learn what sounds are by mimicking. Those sound vibrations that we make in our throats, I want you to feel. Now a deaf person, and I please, I use this term very loosely, um, in hearing impaired, what, what, what. But for the sake of this lesson, deaf people succeed in mastering spoken language in various degrees. Why? Because they are from the sounds that are made in the throat and the vibrations. To overcome this challenge, what have people done that cannot hear? They've learned to sign. And it's a language specifically for people who cannot hear properly all right and here's the whole alphabet and I love this because when I um, worked with with my pupils my learners I said to them try and work out what's going on here and try to talk to each other using these signs and they actually became better at it the more they practiced so you've got all these signs and for example if you were to say to someone you love them you would say there's your L and your O and then we go to the V, which is easy, and then we go back to the E. So that would be, I love you. And you would then do that. So look at your signs, think of a word, um, <coughs> mom, special, and make your own little signs so that you can learn to sign as well. Remember, we always need to respect people. Respect their defects, respect who they are, respect that you need to help and assist them where you possibly can, because that is what it means to be human. All right, let's look at question two. Study the following diagram of the ear and answer the questions that follow. Whoa, here we've got the whole ear. And if I was setting your paper, I would give you a question like this. It's a beaut. So this is the pinna. And remember that your pinna is very individual to a human being. What does it do? It directs the sound waves down this G structure, which is the auditory canal. All right. Then this structure there is for F is going to be the ear drum, or it's also called the tympanic membrane, but eardrum is fine. Then we've got our three ossicles, which are, and I'm doing this so that it's a revision for you. We have our three ossicles, and it's the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. And what do they do? They amplify sound. Then we have C, which is the, now remember O before R, so we've got the oval window. And then the bottom one, E, is on the bottom, it is the round window. And what was the round window's function, people? It was to let excess sound out so that we don't hear an echo. All right? Oval window, the sound wave passes from the, anvil, uh, the stirrup into the oval window and then into the ear structure. D is the cochlea, although it's a very ugly diagram of a cochlea. It's supposed to go like a little uh, um, snail shell. And then those are the semi-circular 
canals. And there are, remember, look here, there were three. All right? Three semicircular canals. And there is our little cochlea. Righty, let's look at our questions. Identify parts B, B and G. Um, B was the semicircular canals, and G was the auditory canal. State the function of each of parts C and E. So let's look at C. Is the oval window. It allows the sound waves to pass from the stirrup into the endolymph of the cochlea. Okay. And I've just, it was B and E, uh, and e so let's look for E. And E is the round window, which, I t as I said, allows the excess sound waves, which have not been converted into impulses, those excess sound waves will pass out here through the oval window to prevent an echo. Okay? Explain why you can often hear a buzzing or humming in your ears uh, um, can often clear buzzing or humming in the ear by swallowing. Now, I want you to actually try this. All right? If take just just close your eyes and focus. And if you swallow, you'll actually be able to hear a funny noise in your ears. Do it. Sit quietly. Close your eyes. And the reason I say close your eyes is so you can focus. Close your eyes and swallow and you'll hear some noise in your ear. So what that humming or buzzing noise does is it changes the eustachian tube, people. So let's go back in our diagram here. There's your eustachian tube. And they, remember, you've got your tongue. That eustachian tube goes into your throat. When you swallow, you actually force air. Let me get another color. You force air up this eustachian tube and you change the pr air pressure on this side, uh, at least on this side, to match that side of your eardrum. Because if you're hearing a humming sound, it's because your eardrum's going zzzz. That's the humming sound. Um, if you listen to really loud music and you, you're really listening to this, awfully loud music at a nightclub, at a party, although you're too young to go to nightclubs, but at a party or wherever, you're going to hear all this noise, all right? And you, as soon as you go outside where it's quiet, your eardrum's still going mad because it's not really your eardrum, it's those little ossicles. Those ossicles are still vibrating because there were little muscles that were holding them in place so they didn't crack open when you were listening to really loud music. So those little muscles are now sitting and they're holding on tight. And you know when you hold on to something very tightly, you start to vibrate? Those little muscles are still going vibrating. The little ossicles are still vibrating. And that's where the humming sound comes from. So when you swallow, you actually force air in here. And that new air that comes in and changes the pressure here relaxes the little bones from moving. So the humming will go away. Why the membrane labeled F is much larger than the membrane at C. And I can't quite remember which membrane it was. So the membrane at C is larger than the membrane at E. Well, very, very clear. Uh, uh, no, it's the membrane at F. Sorry, people. I'm panicking a little bit of time. The membrane at F is larger than the membrane at C because the membrane at F is the tympanic membrane or eardrum, and it's passing that vibration across to the hammer, and the hammer is as small as it can be, but it's still quite large. So we need the tympanic membrane or the eardrum to be larger. Here, it's going in. Now, the sound wave has already been amplified, so it can very easily pass in. And that is the reason for that one. Okay, now, people, a dog has lost part A in an incident. Oi, so let's go back and see. Part A is the pinner. Oh, shame. So the poor dog has now lost its pinner. All right, in an accident. Part A is replaced with a stiff, non-elastic, solid plastic structure. Now they want to know, is the plastic structure as effective as the original ear of a dog? Now, people, we're not looking at human beings, okay? We don't sit and move our ears. We're not little elves. But a dog, what does a dog do? It moves its ears to be able to listen 
and direct towards that sound. You know that police dogs, those Alsatians, they will not accept them into the police force, even with all that training, if their both ears don't stand up and work perfectly, the pinna. All right, so is the plastic structure as effective as the original ear? Not at all. Explain your answer because a dog is able to direct the ear, the pinna, to pick up sound. That's why they hear so well. All right, explain how part D and the retina of the eye function in a similar way. So part D is the cochlea. Now the cochlea is our sense of hearing. And they're asking cochlea versus the retina of the eye. Now what do we have in the cochlea? We have our mechanoreceptors. And in the retina of the eye, we have our photo receptors. Can you remember what those photoreceptors are? The rod and cone cells, remember? Okay, so what is the similar function? In the cochlea, we have mechanoreceptors. In the retina, we have photoreceptors. In both cases, they are receptors that will receive a stimulus. And by the way, we've got light waves and we've got sound waves, all right? Or light rays and sound waves receive a stimulus and they convert that stimulus to an impulse. And please, folks, remember an impulse is the language of the brain. Now, I'll give one reason for part D being spirally shaped. So what are we trying to do here? Why would it be spirally shaped? Because if I take... I can take a meter of string, and if I roll that string up, I can definitely fit more string into a tinier area. So it's to increase the surface area. It's as simple as that. Okay, if I want to take a piece of paper, and I'd want to take this 30 centimeters and put it into one centimeter, I put a fold in it. If I spiral something, look, what have I done? I've spiraled it. I can fit it into a very, very, I mean, if I'm really, I can fit it into a very tiny area. So whenever there is a spiral or a fold, you are increasing the surface area. All right? And that's where I leave you today. So we've done the ear. We've done the eye. And if you are able to see 100% and you have 40-40 vision and you are able to hear properly and listen properly and see properly, people count yourselves very lucky. Always respect people that have an impediment. Look after them, guide them, respect them and help them. And you know what? Learn sign language. So... To all of you out there, have an awesome time and an awesome week. Learn hard. Go back and learn your diagrams and be able to explain the path of light and the path of sound by looking at your diagram. Because if you can visualize it, you will have it and you will know it. Have a good one. Until next time, from me, bye. <laughs>